incredible service so far. Again, happy Mother's Day to all the mothers out there. And happy Mother's Day to all of the spiritual sisters that want to baptize someone and become a spiritual mother. That's tap as a spiritual mother to someone. You know, all you guys are about to give birth today, so that's going to be incredible. And what's the good news email? Not incredible this week. The Good News Network. I'm so grateful that we get to be attached to the whole entire movement. God is moving across the entire world. And sometimes... When we are a small little church of just 14 disciples, it can feel as though nothing is really going on. And even though God has moved so powerfully since we've come to Dublin, that when we came over on the mission team, we only had nine disciples, and now God has multiplied that to 14 disciples. That's incredible. In just four months' time, God is moving around the whole entire world. We are about to reach the 12,000 disciple mark in the movement of God. That is incredible. You saw that as of this year, every single one of the 50 states in America will have a sold out church of true disciples. That's a big deal. And at the end of the year, this year in the European world sector, we'll be planting the Barcelona mission team and the Curacao mission team. And I know, I know all of you say, yeah, I think I need to go to the inaugural in Curacao. And I think uh, the Curacao is a beautiful little island and, and the sea is just sapphire and the beach is just, I'm sure you guys all need to be there to evangelize and all that kind of good stuff. So no worries. If I, if I hear you guys want to sign up for the mission team, I'm going to tell you no. But anyway, but it, it, I was very encouraged personally to see the Latin American Missions Conference. And for those of you that remember, down in the Dublin church, God used you to bring an incredible young woman called Jay to church. And Jay is so special. I believe she was met by our brother Maureen, uh, who's just an absolute fruit machine. Uh, not in the casino sense, but in the, in the spiritual sense. And Jay came out, and I remember the first time Jay came to Campus Devo, and the first time she came to Bible Talk, and I was like, okay, let's get to know this young woman. She was so special. This, sometimes a little stern exterior and then this beautiful flower came out. And as she studied the Bible, we went through some tough moments and we really got in there and, and needed her heart and were mother and father to her and really got, got her to where she needs to be from the scriptures. She said, I want to become a disciple. And as Grace was telling us, hey, sometimes God's timing is not your timing. Your ways are not. And we were saying, oh God, please make Jay stay in Dublin to get baptized. But she had to move over back to Brazil to be with her family. Good news, we have a church there. And just a couple of days ago, Jay started studying the Bible in Brazil. And very soon, Jay will become your sister in Christ. Baptized. And let me tell you a secret. We'll see what God does. But Jay has been praying to come back to Ireland and be a part of this church. So let's see what God does. But it's so awesome to see God moving around the world. Uh, So it's Mother's Day. So I researched some famous mothers. I googled the most famous mothers in the world. You know what number one was? Mary Curie. Actually, Mary Curie. She is the the mother of modern day physics. And she and and her research into radioactivity produced so much of what is now known as chemotherapy, where we cure cancer through radiation. She is the mother, she is the only person to have received two Nobel Peace Prizes for two different fields. That's an incredible woman right there. So most people, yeah, give her a round of applause, Mary, good job, awesome. She devoted her whole life and got a Nobel Peace Prize and then said, I'm gonna go get another one. That's incredible, that's incredible. What's your, what's your end date? What do you got, okay, I've been fruitful once, that'll do. I've planted one church, that, that's my Christianity done. I had one good quiet time this week, that'll probably last me for the rest of the No, 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 no. Mary was like, I'm going, I, I want some more. Give me some, I want, the, I want the Dublin church to have that Mary Curie spirit and go out together. Do you know who the number two was? Elastigirl. From The Incredibles. I was like, really, Google, are you really? Elastigirl from The Incredibles was the most, second most famous mom, and she's a cartoon for one. But you know what? I actually sat there. I'm like, oh, Pixar is like revolutionary. Because I looked, I looked at the family. And I was like, why is she? She's so flexible. And then I realized all of the characters are a caricature. Their superpowers are a caricature of, of the nuclear family. The dad is supposed to be strong. The mom is supposed to be flexible. What's the teenage girl's power? She wants to be invisible and put a shield around her. 
and the sun, you just can't catch them. It's just, just quick, right? I was like, wow, Pixar, that's pretty good going. Oh, well, well done over there, right? But Elastigirl, you, you've got to be flexible as mums. You've got to be flexible. You've got to be able to bend around everything and everyone and then whip back into shape when you need to. She could stretch, 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 stretch and then I went, yup, and it just came, and she was good to go. We've got to be like that as spiritual parents. We've got to be flexible. You can't be rigid in your discipleship. You say, yeah, but Luke, you preached about this this week, and, and next week you preached about that. Yeah, the fire moved. The fire moved. We are gonna, we've got to be a flexible church. And if, oh, go, 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 campus, campus, campus. Now it's single, single, singles. Now we're going to go after this. We've got to go where the fire is. Amen? The third one was an incredible woman called Harriet Tubman. I don't know if you guys know Harriet Tubman. I, I'm just, my man over there knows Harriet Desmond. He's like, oh, yeah, Harriet Tubman. She's a legend. She was a slave, born into slavery, and escaped slavery. Do you know what she did with her freedom? She chose to make herself a slave to win as many as possible. She used the rest of her life and dedicated herself to saving people. Used an underground railroad, which was a secret form of passages, to go out and help more slaves in all these plantations. Putting her life constantly at risk. And she was to be known on several occasions to hold a gun to the head of the people she was trying to save. So you better get in this car. And you guys, yeah, bro, you discipled me too harsh. No, she cared so much about their salvation that she was willing to say, hey, I'm going to kill you if you don't let me save you. And we get a breakup text and go, oh, I guess this person doesn't want to come to church. Well, I'm just going to give up on them. Harriet Tubman is an awesome mother. She cares to the point of death. That's pretty awesome. That's pretty awesome. You know, one of the most well-known mothers in Ireland, of course, is Mother Mary, the mother of Jesus. Ireland loves Mary, but they don't really know what, who she is. And they don't really know what she was all about. And they definitely don't know what the scriptures teach about Mary. So I thought I'd, I'd have a great title for today. Will the real Mother Mary please stand up? <laughs> Will the real Mother Mary please stand up? I, I want to teach a little bit about who Mary really is and, and to honor the mothers in the house today. To honor those who are going to become mothers, I want us to see if we can learn from a mother. And before the brothers tap out and say, okay, I guess this is a message for our sisters. No, no, no. It is absolutely a message for you. Because if Jesus had mothering qualities and he had fathering qualities, if you want to be an effective man of God, you've got to have those qualities too. Amen. You've got to have that gentle and quiet spirit when it suits. You've got to be, have that commanding authority when it suits. You've got to be able to have that bedside manner. And you've also got to be able to rebuke the sin out of people. You need a little bit of everything. Will the real Mother Mary please stand up? A little sneak peek for next week's sermon. It's going to be entitled, Will the real Patrick please stand up? Will the real Patrick? So please come out to find out about who the real Patrick is, because he is also not who Ireland thinks he is, but we'll get onto that. Now, on Friday nights in this room, we usually run a little apologetic seminar. I've been teaching the church about the existence of God. I've been teaching the church about the nature of God. And yesterday, or on Friday, sorry, I taught the church about Jesus being God. And there's a little thing where we dig into some facts and we dig into some scriptures to equip the church. So I'm not going to attempt to do that today and dismantle the Catholic belief about Mary. Although I'm going to teach you a couple things. My main focus is to strengthen your faith. There are three central Catholic beliefs about Mary, however. The first one is the Immaculate Conception. Now, a lot of people have a misconception about the Immaculate Conception. The doctrine of the Immaculate Conception that was taught by Pope Pius is actually that Mary was sinless. It was actually that Mary was sinless. Because how can a sinful woman give birth to a sinless son? So they therefore deduce that Mary must have therefore been sinless in order to give birth to a sinless son. That's a massive issue. And it's just not scriptural. Romans 3.23, everyone has fallen short of the glory of God. In the book of Mark, Mary persecutes Jesus. I'm pretty sure that's a sin. And it all centralizes from the Catholic belief that we are born with original sin. But that's just not in the Bible. Ezekiel chapter 18 says the sin of the father belongs to the father. The sin of the son belongs to the son. Sin is not hereditary. The impact of sin is. If you are born into an alcoholic family, absolutely, you're going to get ramifications of that. But that doesn't cause you to sin, neither does it make you sinful. 
Right. What makes you sinful is that you are you. Yes. That's what makes you sinful. That's true. So that dismantles that Catholic belief. If Jesus was sinless, and then for therefore Mary had to be sinless, did not Mary's mum also have to be sinless? Right. Did not her entire genealogy have to be sinless? Right. Therefore, didn't King David have to be sinless, who was in the line of Mary, and didn't he cheat on his wife with Bathsheba? So I'm pretty sure Mary wasn't sinless. So we know that that's not a biblical doctrine. We know that's not a biblical doctrine. There was another doctrine that's central to the Catholic belief towards Mary, and that is the assumption of Mary. The assumption of Mary means that just like Elijah and just like Enoch, Mary at her death, she would just wish up straight to heaven and is now the queen of heaven. That's what the Catholic Church teaches. That Mary is the queen of heaven and she is the creator of all things. That is not in the Bible. There is no biblical basis for the assumption of Mary. The Bible, in fact, teaches that, that it's when Jesus comes back that we're all going to raise from our graves. We're going to go up to heaven. So Mary is not the queen of heaven. But the third one that I find most interesting is the perpetual virginity of Mary. Again, Pope Pius, wise guy, I'm not sure about that, but he taught that Mary gave birth to Jesus as a virgin, which is in the Bible, but then remained a virgin for the rest of her life. Well, if you look at Galatians chapter 1, this is, this is all. I'm just going to dismantle these couple just, just to give you some equipment, and then we're going to really get into it. I'm going to challenge you guys. I didn't, didn't hear to, to, to rebuke the Catholic Church. I hear to got some demons out of you. That's why you came to church. But I've got to equip you. I've got to equip the same. Look at Galatians chapter 1 verse 19. It says, I saw none of the other apostles, only James, the Lord's brother. How is it that the Lord has a brother and Mary remained a virgin the rest of her life? Mark chapter 3. Mark chapter 3, verse 20, says, Then Jesus entered the house, and again a crowd gathered, so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. When his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, for they said, He's out of his mind. Jesus' family thought he was crazy. So yeah, Luke, but maybe that was Mary and Joseph. Maybe her parents thought he was crazy. Yeah, my parents think I'm crazy, so I can probably see how that can fit together. But if we just read a couple verses later, we find out who that family was referring to. Verse 31. Then Jesus' mother and brothers arrived. Standing outside, they sent someone in to call him. If Jesus had brothers, then how did Mary remain a virgin for the rest of her life? Right. I'll look at Mark chapter 6. Verse 2. When the Sabbath came, Jesus began to teach in the synagogue. And many who heard him were amazed. I hope people are amazed at your preaching. Where did this man get these things? Jesus had nuggets. Do you have nuggets? Mm. Can I say, hey, share, share me your quiet time. And I go, oh, that's fire, bro. Mm. Can I do that? On, Will your quiet time give me faith? Not, not like impress me to go like, oh, wow, bro, you're so insightful. But something I said, wow, that's faith building. Does your quiet time give you faith to give faith to others? Where did this man get these things? What's this wisdom that has been given him that he even does miracles? Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? So not only do we know Jesus had brothers, but we know their names. James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon. Judas, shortened, and Greek is Jude. So the book of Jude that we have back here in the Bible was written by Jesus' brother, as was the book of James. They were way down in the back. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Look at Matthew chapter 1. Verse 24. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he had no union with her until... She gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. The word union in the Greek means to cons consummate their marriage. 
The Bible says that Joseph and Mary were not intimate. They didn't consummate their marriage until after, until after Jesus was born. That means that Mary did not remain a virgin. Mary was a virgin when she gave birth to Jesus, but her virginity was not perpetual. The Bible even says that Jesus had sisters. We know of at least four brothers. We know of a couple of sisters, and we know that Mary and Joseph had some mummy-daddy time when everything was said and done. So those three Catholic doctrines are dismantled. Let's pray for the Catholics. Let's give them a real understanding of the biblical doctrine of salvation. Because the Bible says that we cannot be saved unless we have the right doctrine and the right life. What does that mean? Every single Catholic in this country is condemned to hell. What are you going to do about it? Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. We don't condemn anybody in this church. We just point out the truth. If someone stands condemned by what the Bible says, then us pointing it out does not less or great their condemnation. We just got to help them out. Look, we're going to dig into Mary here. Will the real Mother Mary please stand up? Verse 1. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us. Jesus' validity came from his fulfillment of Scripture. That's what made Jesus who he was. The fulfillment of scripture. Everything that he did was in order to fulfill scripture. He said it at the end of his life. He said, I've allowed all of these things so that scripture may be fulfilled. The whippings and the arrows for that to allow the scripture to be filled. What about you? Mm. What about you? Is your life all about the fulfillment of scripture? Mm. Just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. Therefore, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, it seemed good also to me to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. What an incredible scripture. If you dig into this, the first four verses of the book of Luke are written in academic Greek. This is like his, his, his preface, his, his thesis title. To say, hey guys, this is what I'm about to do. And then from verse 5, he switches into Koine Greek, which is street Greek, so that everyone could understand his letter. He's got like the abstract says, the following findings, da, 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 and then he gets into the tough stuff. And he starts, oh, that, yeah, yeah, so Jesus, yeah, he didn't walk down, and he didn't do that. And he starts talking like that Dublin 1 kind of Greek, you know? <laughs> it, start, it starts off in Dublin 2 Greek, and then he goes to Dublin kind of 1 Greek, and then, and then he gets it. But I love the Greek that he uses in that first four verses. You know the word servants in the Greek means interns? Wow. He said he had a chat to the eyewitnesses and he had a chat with the interns to find out what the facts were saying. And I hope there is everyone who is zealous, not jealous, about Sean becoming an intern in the Dublin International Christian Church. I'm sure no one is jealous because that would be a sin. So I'm sure there's no jealousy at Sean becoming an intern right there. And it says, most excellent Theophilus. Theophilus, Theophilus, friend of God. This isn't written to some Roman governor and this letter is exclusively written to him. No, a Theophilus is one of me and one of you. A friend of God, someone who is in pursuit of God. Luke said, I'm writing this for you. I'm writing this so that in your pursuit of God, in your pursuit of friendship, you may be certain of the things you have been taught. There's a two-step process. First, you've got to get taught, then you've got to get certain of it. We do a lot of teaching in the church. But just because I teach you doesn't mean you're certain. Just because you get taught something by your disciple doesn't make you certain. Luke says, I have taught you, now I've got to make you certain. We become certain by getting deep roots from conviction through affliction. You've got to go through some stuff as a disciple. I want to call the church, get certain. If there are some things that I preach to you, every single member of this church should be studying out the sermons that I preach. Every single member of this church should be studying out the Campus Devo. Every member of the church should be studying out the Bible talks that you attend to get a certainty of the things that you have been taught. We should never be in a place where like, oh, I don't know what to read for my quiet time. Well, I've preached like at least 20 sermons so far being here. So just read those. Make it your certainty. I preach loud to a group of three people because I believe it. 
Do you believe the Bible and the things that I'm teaching as much as I believe the Bible and the things that I'm teaching? Mm. This church would change if we all had a higher level of faith and we had a certainty of the things being taught. Amen? Amen. Point number one. Are you doubtful or dutiful? God finds faith beautiful. Are you doubtful or dutiful? God finds faith beautiful. Are you doubtful or dutiful? God finds faith beautiful. Turn with me to verse 26. Let's dig into Mary here. It says, In the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin, there she is, pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. You ever got that? You go into church and get encouraged and you're like, hey, what's your agenda? You know, what's going on? She was like, wait, why are you being so nice to me? I don't know if that was her heart, but hey. She was pledged to be married to this man. Now, we can deduce from this that Mary was about 16 to 17 years old. This is when traditionally a, a woman would be pledged to be married. Now, a pledge to be married was not this Tinder, TikTok kind of dating relationship stuff here where, yeah, we're, we're pledged, yeah, we're dating, yeah, we're, we're taking things serious. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's not what it is. No, you're going to get married. The way to get out of an engagement back in Jewish antiquity was to get a divorce. If you were engaged, you were as good as married. And you had to make that solid commitment. Right from that, she was 16 years old at the time where an angel came down to her and said, hey, you are chosen by God and you are going to give birth to the Messiah. How would you deal with that? How would you deal as a six? What were you doing at 16? Come on, let's be honest. Well, I don't even know what I was doing at 16. It probably wasn't good. A 16 year old. And who says teenagers can't become disciples? It says in verse 30, the angel said to her, don't be afraid. Mary, you have found favor with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, which means Jehoshua, Jehovah is salvation. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be? Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin. The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. This is an incredible portion of scripture. A 16 year old teenage girl gets an angel come to her and the angels look freaky. Don't think, don't be fooled by, by like, you know, movies and stuff where they come down and all this pretty with wings and all that kind of stuff. In everywhere where you see someone meet an angel, the angel says, don't be afraid. Because why? Because Ezekiel said they're covered in eyes and this kind of stuff. Like, Mary. Like, ah! Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Hey, Manoah, don't be afraid. Hey, Gideon, don't be afraid. Every single one that met an angel, they're like, oh my day. And he says, don't be afraid. But Mary keeps herself composed. And she very humbly asks, how? How will this be? Now, the similar question was asked just a couple verses before by someone else. Have a look at this in verse 16. This is the angel Gabriel telling Zechariah that his wife is about to give birth to a prophet, John the Baptist. Verse 16. Many of the people of Israel will he bring back to the Lord their God, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah asked the angel, How? Can I be sure of this? I am an old man and my wife is well along in years. So you've got Zechariah, the high priest of Israel, say, how can I be sure of this? I'm an old man and my wife is well along in years. And Mary says, how will this be? Mary asks, since I am a virgin. Very similar question, right? right. Do you remember the response that Mary got? The angel said, don't worry, girl. I'm going to like the Holy Spirit and, and we're going to give you a baby and he's going to be the Messiah. Let's see how the angel responded to Zechariah. Verse 19. The angel answered, I'm Gabriel. 
I stand in the presence of God and I've been sent to speak to you and tell you this good news. And now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their proper time. He said, bro, you're faithless. Shut up. <laughs> you can't speak. You can't hear. You're faithless. How is it that one lady asked how and one man asked how and she gets encouraged and he gets rebuked? Mm. How is that so? Well, perhaps there's two different kinds of hows. Mm. Perhaps there's the how of doubt mm. and the how of submission. Right. Wow. You can have the how of doubt mm. or you can have the how of submission. Right. One how says, this can't be done. Right. The other says, your will be done. Mm. One how says, this can't be done. Mm. The other how says, your will be done. You got the doubtful how. And the dutiful how. Mm. The doubtful how. Awesome. And the dutiful how. The doubtful how. And the dutiful how. Mm. Which how have you got. Mm. Today. Look at what he says in verse 35. The angel answered. The Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she was said to be barren is in her sixth month. For nothing is impossible with God. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May it be to me as you have said. Then the angel left her. What do you believe is impossible for God? What have you been challenged to do, but in your heart you've said, how? And not in the humble, dutiful way that God finds beautiful, but in the doubtful way. How should be a question of responsibility, not a question of doubt. If God said, yeah, we need to double this church by March, your how should not be, how can we do that? It should be, what is my part to play? How? What is it that you want me to do to participate in that miracle? That was Mary's how. She said, God, I'm, I'm a virgin. How, how do, what, do you, what do you want me to do? Maybe she was thinking, oh, man, we need to go consummate my marriage with my, with my husband. And then we're going to give birth to the Messiah. Mm. Maybe she said, okay, God, where, where do I need to go to meet this Holy Spirit? God, do you want me to fast? What, what is it that you, what do you need me to do? How do you want me to participate? Mm. Not, how can this be possible? How do you want me to participate? Mm. James 1 says, if we believe and we don't doubt, God will give us Wisdom. You can ask how, but you've got to ask it in faith. God has the power. You ask, what do you need me to do? God, give me wisdom so that I can do what you need me to do. When was the last time you asked your mentor, with faith, how can I be more effective? How can I be, and not, not how can I be more effective, but how can I be more effective? Not, how can I be more fruitful? Mm. Don't you see all these things that I'm doing already? Mm. How can you expect me to have a guest? Mm. Not, how can I have a guest? Mm. What, what is it that, what does my life need to look like in order for me to be a fruitful disciple? Wow. What does my life need to look like in order for me to be able to baptize people? What does my giving need to look like in order for us to self-support and self-fund? I don't know if anyone's really asked that. They broke. How, have you seen my giving? How much do I need to raise my giving for us to be able to put on another intern? Mm. How much do we need to collect? How many people do we need to baptize? How? Show me what we need to do. Get us where we need to be so that we can glorify God. That's the kind of hows that we should be asking. Mm. If we really see ourselves as Mary did, as servants of God, then we walk by faith, not by sight. She believed, my good God will not call me to do something that he doesn't believe is possible. So my how is a question of how, <laughs> rather than a question of doubt. There's some things that can steal our faith. Zechariah's faith was stolen. I don't know what stole his faith, but there's a lot of things that can steal our faith. You know, one thing that, that makes, makes us steal our faith is we make mistakes. And we make one mistake, and then we go, oh, I can't do this anymore. <laughs> anymore <laughs> what made you think that you could do it in the first place 
And that's the issue. We make once we slip up as a disciple, and then we're like, man, I can't do this anymore. That's the issue. You, be you believed that you could do it. And that's why you slipped up. Because you're like, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm a disciple now. I've got the Holy Spirit, didn't you know? I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Yeah, Christ has got to give you strength. You can do all things through Christ who gives you strength. The message version in Galatians 3 says, How did your new life begin? Was it by working your heads off to please God? Or was it by responding to God's message to you? Only crazy people would think that they could complete by their own efforts what was begun by God. If you weren't smart enough or strong enough to begin it, how do you suppose you could perfect it? There's that how again. How do you think? No, no, no. When we make mistakes, we got to shake that dust off. we got to stand up and we say, I'm not letting this mistake define who I am. I'm going to stand strong in the grace of God and I'm going to work hard. <laughs> what else can steal your faith? You know, you can get tired of doing the right thing. You can get tired of doing the right thing. In Galatians chapter 6, verse 9, it says, Don't grow weary in doing good. Why does it say that in the Bible? Because you can grow weary in doing good. And it says just offer because at the correct time you will reap a harvest. So why do we grow weary in doing good? Because we seem to be doing good, 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 and it doesn't seem to be any results. And that makes us lose faith in that goodness. I like Grace. She would say, hey, you've got to do this over a long period of time. Don't expect God to do it in your timing. You've got to keep on doing good because it's good to be good. But that can make us lose our faith. What else can make us lose our faith? Look at 1 Timothy chapter 1. What else can weaken your faith as a disciple? 1 Timothy 1. It says in verse 18. I'll read verse 11 just because I like it. That conforms to the glorious gospel of the blessed God which he entrusted to me. Do you remember what I taught you about that last week? The Bible says the blessed God. That means in the Greek, the happy God. So happiness is a characteristic of God. So if you find yourself as a disciple and you're not happy, it's called being ungodly. Not my chemicals. Not I'm hungry. It's called ungodly. That it's a characteristic of God that we must imitate. Verse 18. Timothy, my son! I give you this instruction in keeping with the prophecies once made about you, so that by following them you may fight the good fight, holding on to the faith and a good conscience. Some have rejected these and so have shipwrecked their faith. The Bible says you can get your faith shipwrecked by not fighting the good fight. What makes you lose faith? Not exercising your faith. You lose faith by not... Ex have you been in a Bible study this week? Have you been in a Bible study where you're trying to help someone else to become a Christian? Have you shared your faith every day this week? Have you done any follow-up this week? Have you discipled your brothers and sisters this week? Every single opportunity you have, when you see a sin in your brother or sister and you ignore it, Satan's gone, thank you. And he's taken a bit more of your faith away. Because you've decided not to get into that good fight. You've decided to be a coward, be a people pleaser, and not confront someone with the scriptures. The Bible says, hey, doing that will shipwreck your faith. You will drown in the ocean of faithlessness. Look at 2 Timothy. He says something similar. For context, verse 17, their teaching will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenius and Philetus who have wandered away from the truth. They say that the resurrection has already taken place and they destroy the faith of some. Paul says, Timothy, if you don't get in the good fight, if you don't disciple people, false teachings, faithlessness, discouragement, sadness will spread throughout the church and everyone's faith will get destroyed. We all have a personal responsibility to go after the demons within the church and without the church. Amen. If we do not, if you do not... Your faith will get shipwrecked. Luke chapter 22. Let's see one more thing that steals our faith. 
How are the faith levels in the church today? Luke. Luke chapter 22 says in verse 31, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. I like this. Jesus is always serious when he says your name twice. When he says, Simon, Simon, same way that you know you get a serious when, it, when someone calls you twice. When it, when it goes to voicemail and they're like, no, I've got to call him again. This, I, I, I usually ignore phone calls until I see a second one. I'm like, okay, cool, this is serious. If I'm busy and Frankie calls me twice in my quiet time, I'm like, okay, must be serious. And I go, honey, I'm having my quiet time. So, oh, okay, I'm, I'm on my way. <laughs> you know, we get that thing sorted out. So if you ever want to reach me, call me twice. <laughs> but I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. How did Satan want to attack Simon Peter? He wanted to take his faith. Simon was at risk of losing his faith. Satan wanted to sift his faith. You know, sometimes the reason why you are low on faith is because Satan is trying to attack your faith. Your faith is under attack. Your faith is under attack. This is, this is unavoidable. This is unavoidable. And Satan asked Jesus to sift Simon as wheat. Do you know what Jesus said? Sure. Because we see Simon's faith go, Phew. Right. Jesus is going to allow Satan to sift your faith. How you respond is the true teller of how much you love God. What do you do when you recognize you're low on faith? For me, that's the scariest possible place to be as a disciple. When I recognize I am low on faith, I go, oh, okay, what do I need to do? When, I, when I'm honest with myself, and it's, it's one of those things where pride really gets in the way, and you go, no, I have faith. Yeah, I, I believe, yeah, I believe we can, I can, we can triple the church. Of course, Luke said it on Sunday. How much faith do you, re be honest. Mm. What are your faith levels like? Be, be deadly honest. Mm. Because you know, you've got a pretty good gauge. You can go, yeah, if I'm honest, my faith is low. But then what do you do with that realization? I fast immediately. Mm -hmm. Whenever I recognize that my faith is low, I fast immediately. Because I understand that it's a spiritual issue. I go, God, I am in sin. I don't really know what it is, but give me wisdom. I'm going to fast until you show me why my faith is so low. I'm going to fast until you protect me against, maybe, maybe I've not done anything wrong, unlikely, but maybe I've not done anything wrong. And Satan is just trying to attack my faith. I've got to fast for that spiritual protection. I've got to fast. God, Satan is trying to attack my faith. So defend me against his attack. No questions. What do you do when you realize your faith is low? Ask yourself, do I believe that I can be fruitful by the end of March? Ask yourself, do I, do I really, if I can be honest, do I really believe? Does the Bible say nothing is impossible for God? It does. But how much do you believe that? Do you believe you can be fruitful by the end of March? Ask yourself. And if the answer is no, that's okay. Fast. Fast for God to increase your faith. Be humble. Like the disciples that said, Jesus, increase our faith. We do not have the faith to accomplish what your will desires for us to accomplish. Galatians 5 says the only thing that counts is faith. That's what it says in Galatians 5. The only thing that counts is faith. Your faith levels are what is going to make a difference in your life. Your faith levels. Where is your faith at today? Let's go back to the book of Luke, chapter 1. Let's go chapter 2. Point number 2. You need to see the bigger picture. God is just fulfilling scripture. <laughs> you need to see the bigger picture. God is just fulfilling scripture. You need to see the bigger picture. God is just fulfilling scripture. I love the Haitian disciples. 17 churches in Haiti, all under gunfire, on the way to a Bible study at risk of your life. And we go, oh, but it's raining outside. We can't evangelize. It's raining bullets in Haiti. And yet the leader of the Haitian churches saw the bigger picture. 
God is just fulfilling scripture. He's allowing us to go through these hardships so that we can comfort those who are going through these hardships. And if you look at verse 1 here, it says, In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to his own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. Now, we learn from the previous chapter that Mary had spent the, at least the first three months of her pregnancy with her cousin Elizabeth. Three months of her pregnancy with Elizabeth. So here on this journey, Mary is at least in her second trimester or her third trimester. The word expecting in the Greek means she was huge. It means she was great with child. She had a big old belly. So most likely she was in the third trimester. You can't really see the belly coming out until the second. And then the third, it goes, shoom. I remember me and Frankie, we were revising for our ICCM. And we were just, I still have the videos. Frankie's there with this huge Finley inside of her belly, like trying to memorize the church leaders across the continent. It's just like, it's, just like, it's tough. It's tough. It is tough to be pregnant. And yet, Mary, the 17-year-old pregnant woman in her third trimester, traveled through the desert 70 miles. Mostly on foot. Maybe on donkey. They were very poor. We find that out a few verses later. To go and give birth to the Messiah. Maybe you would think, God, I'm about to give birth to the Messiah. Couldn't you stop Caesar Augustus from doing this? Couldn't you have changed the course of history to make this a little bit easier for me? God, couldn't you have changed my situation to make this a little... Imagine the power that Caesar Augustus have. You know, his real name was Octavian. He got the name Caesar from his uncle, I believe. I may be wrong on that. But he got the name Caesar from, from one of his uh, pre predecessors. And Augustus was a name given to him by the Roman Senate. Because he was the first person to oversee all of Rome. Rome, as it was growing, was overseen by all the generals. Caesar Augustus was the first person to oversee the whole of Rome. The most powerful person on the face of the planet at this time. They tried to think of a great name for him. You could be called the king of Rome. He said, nah. He said, you could be called the dictator of Rome. He said, nah. He said, what about Caesar Augustus? He said, I like that. Augustus means of the gods. He was Caesar, king of the gods. Caesar of the gods, the most powerful man in the whole of the world. He created the Pax Romana, which is the Roman peace. This was the time that Jesus was walking on the earth. And yet Pax Romana, the Roman peace, was not because there was no war. It was because all the world was enslaved to the Romans. That's not peace. And yet at the Pax Romana, the peace of Rome, was when the Prince of Peace was born to bring true peace. He declared that the whole of the Roman Empire, across all of the world that they had in control, every single person under his rule had to go and give taxes. Had to go and enroll their name. And God chose that as the specific time for Mary and Joseph to have to be forced to go to Bethlehem. Why would God do that? Well, you need to see the bigger picture. God is just fulfilling scripture. Look at Micah chapter 5. Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah. Minor prophet in the Old Testament. Micah chapter 5. Say amen when you're there. Amen. Oh, good job. It's a tricky book to find. Oh my God. Verse 2 says, But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. Or the Hebrew means eternity. God says the Messiah is going to come out of Bethlehem. Where was Mary about to give birth? Nazareth in Galilee. So God led Caesar Augustus, 
the strongest power in the world, which was only really just a puppet for God to fulfill his will. Make a decree to gather everyone to their hometowns, forcing Mary to go to Bethlehem, where she would give birth to the Messiah. Some would think that this world-changing event of Caesar Augustus coming leader of the Roman Empire was a terrible thing. Some would think that this taxation of the whole world was a terrible thing. Some would think that this tyranny in the Roman Empire was a terrible thing. And yet God said, it is exactly what I've ordained it to be to fulfill my scripture. What is going on in your life? What is going in your life? God may not have caused COVID, but he used it. God may not have caused your abuse, but he used it. God may not have caused a recession, but he used it. God may not have caused people hurt in your families, but he used it. God may not have caused any of these atrocities that are going on. God may not have caused the riots in Dublin just a few months ago, but he used it. He used it. I know some of you are here deep down because of that. But you saw the greater need for peace and unity in Ireland. And God planted a seed in your heart by having nationals try and destroy the place. God used that. What is going in your life that you just think is insufferable? That you just, you just can't cope anymore? See the bigger picture! God is fulfilling scripture. Look at Isaiah chapter 9. This is what I love about Mary. She didn't say, God, this is not fair. She said, I want to see the bigger picture. God is fulfilling scripture. Isaiah 9 verse 6 says, For us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, not Caesar Augustus. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. In 750 BC, Isaiah prophesied that God would come as a baby. In 750, before Christ was born, Isaiah prophesied that God would be born as a child. God was just fulfilling scripture. Isaiah 7. Verse 14. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, meaning God is with us. The Bible predicts that Jesus would be born from a virgin, born as a baby, and born in Bethlehem hundreds of years before it happened. And it would have only happened in that way if the world was not falling apart. God allowed the world to fall apart so that his scripture could fall in place. When it seems like everything you are going through is making you fall apart, God is truly putting it back in place. This is why I'm so proud of our soon-to-be sister, Anna. So proud. Anna said, I'm not going to live in fear anymore. I'm going to decide to forgive so that I can be forgiven. God allowed me to go through this pain so that I can save others from that same pain. God allowed me to experience this sin so that I can save others from that same sin. And today, Anna has come to be baptized and get her sins forgiven. Get her sins forgiven. This, this, this is awesome. God is fulfilling scripture. Don't worry. God is in control. Look at the bigger picture. We just had a referendum in Ireland. They were trying to change the constitution to change the definition of a nuclear family trying to take the words of God out of the Irish constitution, trying to fight to say that we we can't use the word woman in the constitution, it's too suggestive, it's too misogynistic, that we can't, we've got to take away the role of mothers inside the thing and just say, you know, just a carer. You know, because anyone can be a carer this day. No, mothers are mothers, fathers are fathers. And I saw yes campaigns all over the city. On Friday, you had people handing out these yes flyers, evangelizing like crazy for this satanic agenda. 
But you know what is incredible? The whole of Ireland said, what? This government is nuts. And even though I saw barely no, no campaigns, I saw maybe one flyer per 1,000 flyers for the no campaign, they won by about 70%. They won by about 70%. Now, Jesus didn't conform with political parties, but I like that. I like that the people of Ireland say, this is crazy. How can you try and change the definition of a mother? How can you try and change? How can you take away the honor that mothers deserve? A father cannot fulfill that role. I'm a proud dad. And my wife is a proud mom. And my son, if he had either of those roles taken away from him, it would be devastating for his life. Devastating. I love everybody. I love homosexuals. I love transgender people. I love them all. I want to help them to know the truth. But I was a school teacher. And the children that had same-sex parents would devastated mm. saw this kid so confused when both of his dads would come and pick him up from school so confused so distraught without the love of her mother and his and he gets told off by all these people and I'm, guys you don't see it the reason why he's acting up he doesn't have a mom mm. he doesn't have a mom if finley only had me he would be stuffed mm. if finley if my wife tried to be the dad and wear the trousers my son would be ruined. Mm. If, it's, if I tried to be all soft and, you know, no, my son, I really want a, this nice relationship with my son, my son would be ruined. Mm. I've got to be the dad. Mm. And my wife has got to be the mom. And I'm so grateful that six years ago I became a Christian because God's plan for my life wasn't just for me to be saved, but to be a model for a Christian family, to be a model for a Christian father, to change nations. To ch he has that dream for you. He wants to make you, he, he, when he baptized you, he wasn't just thinking about you. Yeah. Don't be so selfish. Yeah. This isn't about you. Yeah. This is about the generations that come after you. Yes. Your salvation, your baptism, and as your today is not just about you. Yeah. Tommy was, is not just about Tommy. Yeah. This is the whole world as God trying to change through Shinji becoming a disciple. Oh. God is trying to change the whole world. The whole world through your faith. Look at the bigger picture. God is fulfilling scripture. Luke chapter 2 verse 22. Point number 3. You will function at your best when your weary soul finds rest. You will function at your best when your weary soul finds rest. Your weary soul. Luke chapter 2. Verse 22, bit of context. Jesus is born, his parents are awesome. So it says in verse 22, that was your context. When the time of their purification, according to the law of Moses had been completed, Joseph and Mary took him, that's Jesus, to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. And there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon, who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles. And the Gentiles said, Amen. That's, that's all of us, by the way. We're not Jews. And for the glory to your people Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be spoken against, so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. Mary was told, Hey, this beautiful baby that you have, oh, he's going to grow up and he's going to cause some trouble. He's going to grow up and cause some trouble. 
that the purpose God has chosen for this young child's life is to be a troublemaker. And God says the same for you. At your baptism, he said, yeah, the purpose I've got for you is for you to stir up some trouble. For you to get into that country and to ruffle some feathers. To you to preach against the darkness. To preach against the demons. You sit in a, in a sermon like this, you're like, man, who is Luke, pre- Luke preaching to? Is it Sean? Is it Maureen? I'm trying to preach to all of Ireland. I'm trying to preach to all of Ireland. And Jesus said, hey, we're going to cause some trouble. But I like that fact that Simeon said to Mary, a soul, a sword is going to pierce your soul. God's word prepares us for the troubles of life. How well do you respond to challenges? God tells us pain is promised and purposeful. But time and time again, we go through pain and decide to allow it to put us away from God. Which is actually what Mary allowed to do for a moment. Remember when Jesus started his ministry and Mary said, this dude is crazy. And she did not want a part of Jesus' ministry anymore. She became one of Jesus' persecutors. And yet, by the end of his life, she watched him die on the cross. And that's what made her become a disciple. We find her praying with the rest of the disciples in Acts chapter 1. It's only when we fix our eyes on the cross that we can see our pain in a biblical way. Jesus is trying to get you to grow. He says, your soul will be pierced. That's a guarantee as a disciple. Your soul is going to be pierced. You are going to experience pain. You are going to experience challenges. You are going to experience hardship. Maybe you've been treated harshly this week. What have you learned? What have you learned from it? Maybe your disciple has let you down. Maybe you've missed D time a couple of times. What have you learned from it? What have you learned from it? Maybe your boss spoke to you rudely. What have you learned from it? Maybe someone that you were studying the Bible with ran away. What did you learn from it? Maybe you got someone all the way up to counting the cost and they tanked on you. What did you learn from it? Maybe you've been abandoned, put down, disappointed. What did you learn? The Bible says in Hebrews 12, no discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. What does this teach us? When you're going through something painful, it's probably discipline. Whether self-inflicted or not, God is you. Remember, remember the bigger picture. God is fulfilling scripture. God is sovereign over everything, even over your sin. In the book of Judges, Samson sinfully married a Philistine woman, but the Bible says that God used it so that he could destroy the Philistines. God can even use your sinful decisions to fulfill his will. So if you are experiencing pain, though it may be self-inflicted, it's still under God's sovereignty. There's still a lesson he wants you to learn from. Mm. Have you fallen in sin this week? Mm. What's the lesson? Right. Maybe, you've, maybe you watched pornography this week. Mm. Maybe you masturbated this week. What's the lesson that God wants you to learn? Does he want you to learn, hey, look, you, you cannot do it mm. without the brothers around you. See, you didn't talk to anyone this week and you fell into sin. Mm. What's the lesson? You better get in touch with the brothers. Right. You better be close with the brotherhood. Maybe it's the sisters. You better be close to the sisters. Maybe he's teaching you a lesson. Remember, how good were your quiet times this week? Uh, Maybe learn the lesson of terrible quiet times lead to terrible sin. Maybe God is trying to teach you through that hardship, through that pain, self-inflicted or not. He's trying to teach you a lesson. Don't waste the pain. Don't waste the pain. Pain is just pain if you don't learn anything from it. No one likes going through pain. It's unpleasant. So why not at least get the most out of it by learning from it? Every trial is a teacher. Every rival is a rabbi. Every defiance is a discipler. Every problem is a professor. Every adversary is an advisor. Not yet, honey. Every hardship is a herald. I'm I'm keeping preaching, don't worry. She thought I was coming to a close because I was like rhyming stuff. It's okay. I I still still got more. Unless you guys want me to stop preaching. It's okay. I don't mind. I don't mind, it's okay. She, she, she said, oh, he's on a roll. He must be stopping. Anybody? He's getting out to the end. When, when our soul gets pierced, that requires soul healing. When our soul gets pierced, this is what you, we, we don't realize as a disciple. The, the, what you are feeling, the pain you are feeling is the sword piercing your soul. 
It's our soul that gets pierced. But we try to mend spiritual problems physically. Let me just take another Xanax. Let me just take my depression medicine. You're not depressed, your soul is pierced. Now, amen, if you've got a chemical condition and you've got a prescription from a doctor, fair enough. I found that about 99% of cases of depression is your soul is pierced. Mm. There is a spiritual issue. If you are seeking God with all of your heart and you're still feeling depressed, I'll take you to the doctor. I'll go there with you. Mm. But if you're not seeking God with all your heart and you claim to be depressed, your soul is pierced. Your soul is pierced. But we try to solve our spiritual problems physically. The solution is never more sleep. It's never just more sleep. Oh, I think the reason I'm feeling sad is because I need more sleep. That's never just the issue. The solution is never just changing your diet. Oh, I'm feeling so... Maybe maybe I'm not having enough iron in my system. That's not the solution. Romans 8.5, let me read this for you. It says, Those who live according to the sinful nature have their minds set on what that nature desires. Your mind is set on your physical needs and you can't stop thinking about how tired you are. We earnestly believe we need more sleep because our minds are set on our natural needs. You've got to train your mind to think spiritually. When you're going through something, you've got to go, okay, what is the spiritual issue going on? Let me deal with the spiritual issue before I try to deal with anything else. You're going to realize once that spiritual issue is dealt with, you've probably fixed the physical issue. You've probably fixed the spiritual issue. It's not about your diet. It's not about your sleep. It's about your sin. You need to learn how to spot the spiritual indicators on the dashboard. You need to learn to spot the spiritual indicators on the dashboard. You ever felt like you keep getting frustrated with someone? Like, yeah, we're cool, we're cool, 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 cool. But when they come in, you're like avoiding them a little bit? You kind of don't want to talk to someone in the fellowship. You kind of don't want to give them a hug when you greet them. Not like a uh, straight up anger, but it's just like, why is everything that they say making me a little bit annoyed? That's a spiritual indicator. That's a spiritual indicator. I've, I've learned through my own personal experience that the issue is that they've probably sinned and I haven't called it out. They've probably sinned and I haven't called it out. So I've allowed a root of bitterness come out in my heart. The Bible says in 2 Timothy 2.24 that the man of God must be able to teach, not resentful. Yeah. Mm. So if you're feeling resentful, it's probably because you haven't done us teaching. Mm. And something is bothering you about that person, but you haven't made the decision to teach them. Mm. To be patient and say, hey, this is super annoying. <laughs> right. look, at, yeah. look, at this, look at this scripture. You, send, you bury it down, you're a people pleaser, you're embarrassed, you're a coward, and you don't confront. Look at 1 Timothy 4.6. This is an incredible scripture. I'll read it in the uh, 2004 NIV. It says, If you point these things out to the brothers and sisters, you will be a good minister of Christ Jesus, nourished on the truths of the faith, and of the good teaching that you have followed. The Bible says you get nourishment when you're calling it out. The reason you may feel sleepy every day is because you're a coward. Cowardice is causing you to be sleepy. Because you're not calling it out. You see it, some of you, you guys are way too wise. You guys are way too discerning. This church is full of people. You see my sin, I know. That's why I confess it every week on Sunday, because you guys can't get me before I get myself. <laughs> All right? You guys see everything. Some of you guys live together. You see everything. You see it all, but you're not confronting it. That's why you're sleepy. Your, your soul is pierced because of sin. Do you want to know another indicator? That there's something, something fishy going on where your soul is pierced? Decreased messaging on the group chat. You you, you used to like emoji it up. Liking everything, commenting, gif, 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 all that kind of good stuff. But now you've, 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 you've pulled away a little bit. A decrease in fellowship usually indicates an increase in hidden sin. A decrease in fellowship usually indicates an increase in hidden sin. 
1 John 1, 7 says, If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. So we pull back. Hey, we're not, we're not so fired up on those group chats anymore. Not so fired up in the fellowship. It's probably an indicator of some hidden sin in your life. Now, an indicator is a system's way of warning you of potential hazards. Sometimes people have just had a tough week. Sometimes the biggest sin that they're in is just not telling people that they feel a bit down. Yeah. Amen. But the indicator appears because something needs to be checked. The car bleeps, they say, just, just check, just in case. You may take it to the MOT, you may take it to the garage, and they say, no, it's, it's totally fine. It's just a, a, a faulty system. You just didn't quite discern it correctly. But they need to be checked. Right. If you spot those indicators in the church, man, this sister, she's not been writing too much on the group chat. My sister gave me a weird side hug. You've got to ask, hey, are you okay? It's, it, maybe, it's not, maybe it's a wrong indicator. Right. Maybe it's indicating nothing. But have you checked? Yeah. You know another good indicator on the dashboard? A change in your eating habits or your physical appearance. Oh. Yeah. A change in your eating. You know a brother is doing badly spiritually when his hair looks mad scruffy oh. and he didn't shave his beard. Hey. When, when he, I mean, some brothers come into the church like that and you've got to you sort them out. But brothers who are usually sharp, if they come in and they've like got this t-shirt tucked out oh. and you're like, bro, are you doing okay spiritually? <laughs> and just like, Last week you were wearing a suit and tie. This week, I mean, what's, what's, what's going on? Sometimes that's a legitimate thing. The Bible says in Philippians 3.19, it refers to people who have turned away from their sensitivity of God and turned towards their stomach. The Bible says your God is your stomach. Yeah. Your eating habits can discern something spiritually. I've noticed like extra snacks in the house. I'm like, hey, what's going on here? Who's eating all this cake? We used to eat carrot sticks. What's going on? Yeah, no, I'm being deadly serious. You, you guys think, oh yeah, I know Luke's doing you just being uh, no. If if I do, do you care about your brothers and sisters that much? That you notice? I saw I saw a donut in the cupboard. That's not usually there. Now it may just be an indicator on the dashboard, but do you check? Do you say, sis, are you okay? Are you getting your needs met by sugar? Mm. I'm being dead serious. How have your quiet times been? Your, if your quiet times aren't sweet enough, wow. that you need to turn to cake and cookies. Wow. That's a, a cause for concern. Physical appearance. David said in, in the Psalms, sorry, I can't remember which Psalm, he said, my bones wasted away. Wow. He looked physically brittle because he was in hidden sin. In Matthew 6, it says, The eyes are the lamp of the body. Your eyes can grow dim when you are in sin. Mm. I look you guys dead in the eyes when I'm song leading. I'm like, okay, who's, who, who, where are you guys at? If you, uh, your eyes aren't bright. And some of us just have bright eyes naturally, but you can totally tell when you're hiding something. <laughs> you know? Even blemishes. According to Ephesians 6, the Bible says the, the husband's got to wash the wife with the word to get rid of stains, wrinkles, and blemishes. Sometimes your skin condition is an effect of your sin condition. The Bible, throughout the Bible, usually women. Usually women in the Bible, when God wanted to discipline them, he gave them leprosy. Mary, she was gossiping and she came up with all the skin issues. Brother would just go, oh, no worries, bro, and just scrub it off, slap some Vaseline. Sisters care about their skin, so God disciples them on their skin. So if you want to be insecure, cool, I'm going to give you a skin disease so you can see that I'm going to get your security from me. You want to be anxious? Great, cool. Here's a zit right between your eyes. That's how much God loves you. That's how much God loves you. Physical appearance is an indicator of your spiritual appearance. You don't believe me? Just, just watch. Just watch. It's in the Bible. Some of you are looking at me like I'm like rude. It's in the Bible. You will function at your best when your weary soul finds rest. I want to encourage the church. Where you are at right now is a condition of your soul. Your physical outward appearance, your physical manifested, your physical body, your physical effort, your physical faith is a result of where your soul is at. You need your soul to be sharpened. You may need a spiritual MOT today. Get fixed up by a Bible study. If you're a guest, you're visiting for the first time and you have no idea what this ginger man is saying in front of you, get into a Bible study. Find out why this tiny church is so passionate about what we are doing. Get some faith in your tank. 
so that you can drive that spiritual car all the way on the narrow path to heaven. If we are all filled with faith, like this young Mother Mary, we will double this church by March 31st. We will triple the church by October this year. I want to challenge you. If you are studying the Bible, pursue more faith this week to get baptized as soon as possible. If you're already a disciple, get the faith that you need to be able to make a disciple. Let's evangelize all of Europe, including our moms. I love you. To God be all the glory.